Welcome. We're just starting to let people into the room and we're going to begin the call momentarily. We're going to get started in just one more minute. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and get us started. Um, I know we have a lot to talk about and I'm sure other people will join in the next couple of minutes. It's great to see all of you here. Um, if you're here for the call, Grief and Resilience in the Negev, Bedouin Jewish Emergency Responses, you're in the right place. It's good to see familiar and new, new faces. And I especially wanna welcome our speakers and guests today, Shira, Hanan, and Lila. I know you're incredibly busy and barely sleeping as you've told me and that it's a really painful and emotional time. So we're really grateful for you taking time out of your evening to join us. My name is Erica. I'm the Associate Director US at IATF. I'm joined by many other members of our team if you wanna wave and say hi. Um, since there are a lot of people who registered for this call, I wanted to note that we're gonna only limit the chat to staff and speakers today. But we also have a Q&A feature, and I encourage you to leave your questions in the Q&A throughout the program. IATF staff will be there to write in answers and help answer clarifying questions. And then we're really going to dive into the Q&A in the latter half of the call. This is the first of what we're planning to be a number of public calls focused on the experiences of Arab citizens of Israel and Jewish Arab relations in the aftermath of October 7th and the ongoing war. I wanna just acknowledge that for some people on this call, you've been learning about and following these topics since the moments after the tragedy in this period began. For others, this might be the first time you're really diving into exploring the experiences of Arab citizens of Israel during this period. Um, so just to note that we're all learning together, hearing new perspectives and to be mindful of how we're navigating this difficult moment and how it impacts our communities. I hope that today's conversation will raise perspectives and draw attention to experiences we might have had less exposure to in the American Jewish community, and also to really highlight the work that professionals, leaders, and change makers are doing in the Negev as a source of possibility and perhaps even hope as we both grieve and slowly begin to look forward. As you know, today we're focusing in on the Negev. So before I invite our speakers to join us in a conversation, I just wanted to give a little bit of framing information um, about the context for our conversation. There are about 300,000 Bedouin living in the Negev. It's a growing population that represents somewhere between a quarter to a third-ish of the Negev's population. Over the last decades, there's been great strides in socioeconomic development, including higher education, um, but still Negev Bedouin remain the most economically disadvantaged population in Israel. Approximately two thirds of Bedouin population live in six formally recognized municipalities established by the state of Israel, um, including Horo, which we're gonna be hearing a lot about today. The remaining third, again, numbers are a little spotty, but roughly a third live in unrecognized villages. We're gonna be hearing more about unrecognized villages from Hanan, and this could be its own call on to itself, but just to give a quick definition, these are rural communities that aren't formally recognized or authorized by the state, and they have limited infrastructure. In part due to ongoing land disputes, these communities often lack access to running water, electricity, public transportation networks, and particularly relevant today is rocket shelters. Bedouin communities were profoundly impacted by October 7th and its aftermath. Over 20 Bedouin citizens lost their lives that day, both from rocket fire and being directly killed in Hamas attacks. Um, and many were taken hostage, as we're gonna be hearing more about today. Um, and Bedouin were involved in leading and initiating and participating in many heroic rescues. Some stories that are being told and some stories that are still being learned about today. Negev Bedouin are also among the most under-equipped communities for these types of emergency situations lacking adequate shelters, information, and resources. 
as we talk about the tragedies and difficulties besetting the South, it's also really important to talk about the moving stories of collaboration, solidarity, and resilience, some of which we're going to be hearing today. Jewish and Arab residents work together with support from the rest of the country to meet the humanitarian needs of the South and to also try to preserve Jewish-Arab relations, which are fragile and challenging in a time of war. So to share more of their firsthand experiences and insights about these dynamics, I want to bring our speakers into this conversation. Their full bios um, will be added to the chat. Shira is the CEO of the City of Hora, and Hanan is the director of the Bedouin Women Rights Center at Itak Maki. They're both going to bring their personal perspectives and insights through their work, Shira through the lens of local government, and Hanan through her work as a civil society leader. So we're gonna have a conversation. The three of us also bring Layla in to share some of her story and tell us about her son. And then we'll also open things up for a broader, um, to take Q&A in the latter half of the call. So um, Hanan and Shira, the first question I wanted to ask, and we'll start with Hanan, is how have Bedouin communities been impacted by October 7th and the ongoing war? What are you, your colleagues and community members feeling and experiencing over the last six, seven weeks? Hanan, you're on mute. Now you can hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. So hello, and thank you for the opportunity to participate in this important call. Uh, as you said, Arika, and uh, my name is Hanan Sane, a mother of four children. I belong to the Arab Bedouin community in the Negev. The Negev is a desert area in the south of Israel. I'm from Beersheba, a city in the south. I have been active for over 22 years for women's rights in general and for the Bedouin women in the unrecognized villages specifically. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, Erika, it's true that we are uh, about 300,000 Bedouin who are citizens of Israel. And we are also 30% of all of the total Negev population. Some of us live in recognized villages, which planned by the state. And the other Bedouin live in 33 unrecognized villages. Because they are unrecognized villages by the state, there are no basic service no access to electricity, no access to water, no access to health services. This is true for 100,000 Bedouin citizens of Israel, and they daily face a house demolition policy. As uh, you heard, my community was one of the populations that was hit hard by the Hamas attack on the 7th of October. In the first minutes after receiving a message of the massacre, we felt fear, sadness, personal insecurity, and for, and of course, we feel confusion, confusion as a Bedouin, as an Arab, as an Israeli citizen, as a Bedouin, as a Palestinian who has part of their tribe also in Gaza. But we were not confused in deciding to help our neighbors in Otef Gaza. In the early morning of the 7th of October, thousands of Bedouin went to attack the attacked area. Together, citizens of the Negev, Jews and Arab, the citizens stood together and worked saving lives, locating missing persons, moving the families who survived the massacre to a safer place. Taking injured people to the hospital, opening their homes, I want to tell you one of the story. In the medical staff, the medical staff, Arab and Jews in Soroka Hospital, including those who were on their day off, worked hard to save lives of hundreds of citizens. Everyone was very was trying to face the disaster. A group of extremists from like La Familia arrived to the hospital and started shouting with their favorite phrase, death to, the, to Arab, Arab, Mavit Arabim. A group of Jewish families from the victims 
went to them and asked them to leave the place. They told them, Bedouin youth risked their lives to save us. And now doctors and nurses are working hard to save our families. And they also have victims. Please leave the place. We have suffered through a disaster and we have a lot of pain. These stories didn't reach to the media until an NGO brought them to the public three weeks later. And in the same day, in the end of the day, we were informed about the results of the attack. Unfortunately, we have 1,400 1, killed. And in our community, we have 21 killed and seven hostages. On the first day of the war, six people were killed, including four children from the unrecognized village El Baten by Hamas rocket. Suddenly, we remembered that most of the unrecognized villages are exposed to Hamas, to Hamas rockets. These villages appear in the Iron Dam system as an open area, and there are no shelters and no rocket alarms. Uh, as I said, all the Arabs and Jews saw only darkness in, the, in that day and felt a deep pain. There was a huge crisis of confidence, trust between the Arabs and the Jews, a feeling of helpless and helpless. This war impacted the Bedouin community, specifically the women in the unrecognized villages. From the stories that we collected from the women in our center, the Center for Bedouin Women Rights, we, wrote, we also wrote a position paper for the needs of the women. For example, there is a lot of means that came from there that they need the a mental health because the women and the children shivering from fighting because of the rockets and the damage caused the families at homes. They feel completely exposed. Also with the economic issue, especially the women who work in agriculture and the cleaning. Uh, jobs and were paid by Howard. Also, they feel, also they suffered from an uh, from, from food uh, security. And uh, also in this period of unfortunately, uh, we 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 are aware that the violence inside the, in the family and economic violence uh, are on the raise. And or despite all these problems, I have to tell to the Armani. It's true that we are faced during this war a lot of problems, and we feel that there is darkness and uh, a lot of obstacles. But we still uh, make sure that the Bedouin still insists to being part of the solutions, thanks to the local uh, Arab and Jewish uh, work together. We are we were able to provide for the problems I discussed. True, there is not enough for everything we need and for everyone. However, our solutions are definitely modeled for future work. As an active Bedouin woman, feminist who decided to break to break walls during her ride, I created the hopes despite all the odds. I was always told that you will not succeed. However, I showed uh, everyone that I can succeed. Also in this sensitive and difficult situation with war ar all around, I believe that we have created the hope that we was missing during our two uh, big projects. And this is for the first uh, question. Thank you, Hanan. I I have so many follow-up questions on the kind of work that you've been doing with Itach Maki um, in the Situation Room. But before we go in a little bit further, I wanted to invite Shira to speak and also to bring Lila into the conversation. Shira, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you. So, hello. Um, 
As Erika said, my name is Shira Ochana. Uh, I grew up in Yerucham, a small village in the Negev, half an hour uh, driving from Chura. And um, for the, fifth, the 15 month, uh, I have the privilege of being CEO of uh, Chura Municipality, the second large Bedouin city in the Negev, right after Rahat. I was chosen to this role by Chabes El Atauna, the mayor of, ha of Chura, at the last five years. And before we dive in, I cannot talk about, about my role in Hura without pointing the complicity, the complexity. I am here to tell you about Hura, uh, but as you can see, I am not a Bedouin. And yet I wish to bring you the Bedouin's voice without being one of them. I have to say, it in these days, it sometimes feel like I'm not here nor there, but sometimes it feels it has the power of being a bridge between here and there. And now I will uh, tell you about uh, this period of time that you are up to uh, um, to know better. So. On the morning of October 7th, the entire state of Israel woke up uh, to the sound of nonstop alarms. For the residents of the Negev, these alarms were also accompanied with terrifying explosions, uh, which made it clear very, very soon that what, it, what was happening was unlike anything that had happened before. A little after seven o'clock in the morning, the alarm was sounded in Hua also and the whole uh, picture became clear and terrible. The Al-Quran family, a father, his three children, and his nephew were killed by direct mi missile hit. As the hours passed, we got uh, more bad news. Habib Abulkian, a fighter in the 30th battalion in Golani, uh, fell in the battles in Gaza Strip, and Samar Al-Talalka was, uh, was kidnapped and tonight is still in the hand of Hamas in Gaza. His mother, Laila Al-Talalka, is with us uh, now, and she's going to tell you uh, a little bit about him and her experience. Laila? Good evening. I am talking about the English language. I am talking about the English language. Michal is talking about the English אה, בסדר, מיכל. אני טלקה לילה בת חמישים, אימא לעשרה ילדים, ברוך השם. So my name is טלקה לילה, לילה על טלקה. I'm 50 years old and I have 10 children. God bless them. אני מורה ותק 35 שנה, משרד חינוך, מלמדת. So for the past 31 years, I've been a teacher in an elementary school in Chura. So Laila has a first and second degree in education, BD and MED from Barilan University. So Laila wants to share with us, um, Shira has invited her to share with us their own story that happened on October 7th, which is very, very unusual in Hora, very unique. How old is it? Kamaru, Laila? So um, Laila's third son, third child, and, and actually eldest son, but he's number three in the, between the children, 
was kidnapped on October 7th in the morning. Samer is 25 years old. The summer was working in agriculture near Kibbutz Nir Am in what we call the surroundings of Aza, Otef Aza. On October 7th, it was his shift. So on Saturday, he usually works there with his father and his brother, but on Saturday he was there on his own because on Saturday it's a very, not, not, not a lot of work, best work. so Samer is a wonderful kid, he or person. Um, he is very, very loved. And we didn't even realize, we didn't even know how much loved he was. But now that he was kidnapped, we had many, many visitors from various families, people who really liked him and are coming to condolence us and, and see how we are and what they can do. He had a motorcycle and he loved traveling, he loved being out in the fields daily. She really, really misses him. It's over 50 days by now. It's, I think, 52 days. But they've heard that he's alive. And inshallah, something good will happen soon. Thank you. Thank you. Just, uh, before, um, before Lila goes, that, um, just, I want, I want Lila to know that all of us in the call have, have her family and our thoughts and prayers and that we're, we're sending our warmth and, and support and, and gratitude for you sharing your story with us. I know it must be really difficult right now. הקושי בחיים, הכל, כל שגרת העבודה, כל השגרת החיים שלנו השתנה, פחד, דאגות, קושי, חשיבה, הרבה חשיבה, ממש קשה, ממש קשה, ממש קשה, ואנחנו מקווים, מקווים, מקווים שיחזור אלינו בשלום, הוא וכל השאר של הנעדרים בעזה, שיחזרו כולם להורים, אפילו בכל העולם, שכל שכל מי שנעדר, שכל אימא תהנה ותחבק את הבן שלה שהוא רחוק ממנו. תודה רבה. תודה רבה. Just added that... זה אני משוחררת? כן. אני משוחררת. יאללה, ביי.
Michal, you want to translate the last So piece? just to say, yeah, sorry. Uh, Lila was sharing how hard it was ever since October 7th. They really are always worried, can't really think, can't really work. It really changed their whole routine and her, their whole <laughs> life, daily life. And she's praying that he'll come back and that all the hostages will come back and that uh, uh, every mother will be able to hug her boy or girl. Anna, bye. Thank you. Thank bye. you. Okay, I think we'll, we can do we can do one question and then I know we didn't okay. want to do too, Lila didn't want to see too many questions and I also want to give I'll ask it in English. Questions. I'll ask it in English. It's uh, my wife Rosie and me. We are in Meitar, next door to Khura. Neighbor, to Khura. And uh, I would like to ask Lila, uh, first of all, uh, I know that the family of Talalka has a branch in Rahat as well as in Khura. Could you elaborate a little bit how the family is split between Khura and, and Rahat? And also, do you have a, a shelter in your home in Khura? A mamad or miklat or whatever? Uh, shall I start again? Yes. Yes. אני חושבת שהשאלה ככה על המשפחה והרקע המשפחתי זה קצת מעבר לשיחה שלנו היום, נכון? אז, אז נשמח לשתף אותך. אם היא לא רוצה, בסדר, אין בעיה. לא, אני לא שאלתי אותה אפילו, הייתה שאלה לגבי המשפחה הרחבה. אם היא תרצה, תספר לנו קצת על המשפחה. תודה. אז בעצם לילה השאלה הייתה על האם יש לכם מקלט או ממ"ד בבית? כן, אנחנו בונים בית, בתים רגילים, אין מקלט, אין, יש לי שתי קומות, בית שתי קומות. נכון שהמגזר הבדואי, יש פזורה הרבה חיים בפזורה שאין להם מקלטים, אך אנחנו בחורה, כמעט הרוב יש להם מקלטים. So, Lila says that their house has a shelter, um, and it's a relatively new house, it's well built. Um, since uh, this family, Lila, Lila's family live in Khura, Khura is actually well, um, there are shelters. It's very different from the unrecognized villages. Shukhura is a city, and I'm sure Shira will, will tell yeah. us more about that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. תודה רבה, אני הייתי שמחה להיות איתך, אבל יש לי מה לעשות, מהבוקר לא בבית. יאללה, בהצלחה. יאללה, ביי. אז לילה סטורי זה סמפל של בדואים סוסייטי בנגב, ספשילי אחרי אותו דבר ודאי ואיתו ואיתו. On one hand, the Bedouins suffered and suffering uh, great losses. As uh, Hanan said, seven kidnapped in Gaza, 21 murdered, and over 200,000 living in houses without shielding, living constantly in fear for, from missiles attack fr coming for, from Gaza. Unfortunately, that is not the, the whole story. The first time I visit Laila after October 7th, I suggested her to meet other mothers who are experiencing the, terrible, un, the terribly unusual difficulty she is facing now. I saw Laila was hesitating and uh, when I asked her what is going on, she, asked, she, she answered me in a voice that made me cringe. that she is not sure this is a good idea because she doesn't know if they would accept her there. This was the, the moment I knew it was a must, that we must go together to meet other Jewish mothers of hostages. So after Lila agreed uh, going together to the kidnapped uh, square in Tel Aviv, every week at the last minute, Lila canceled our plan. Last Thursday, Lila felt uncomfortable uncom with letting me down again, so she didn't cancel, and we went together. On the 500 meters uh, from the parking lot to the square, three different people suspiciously asked her, uh, who is 
whose photo is it on the sign, uh, sign we held and the sign with Summer, her son picture and name. One of them also shouted to Lila, why are you holding this sign here in Tel Aviv? And even after she answered, it is my son uh, that was kidnapped to Gaza, the man was doubtful and asked her firmly if he is a Muslim and if she is telling the truth. Lila, of course, froze at that moment and wanted to go home. Since I had to ride her home, I could convince, convince her uh, to stay a little longer. We made an agreement that we would reach the square and after an hour, if she wants to leave, we would bring her home back, back home. So we continued uh, our way to the square and half an hour later, as we were walking in the square, she got warm interest and solidarity from dozens of people that asked her for a hug and did their best to give her up by declaring her fight to bring Samuel home is their fight too. This is the range that features uh, the life of Bedouin uh, in Israel these days. This is also the range of dangers and opportunities that can grow from this crisis. The range between fear and ignorance to warm and shared destiny. Will we succeed to find our shared destiny and create covenant of life? Can we lower the fence of suspiciousness and fear between the communities? Will we be able to find shared goals and interest and work together to achieve them? We must do. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, really, it's so powerful and emotional to hear what you're sharing. And it's so important that these, these stories are making it to the American Jewish community here today. Um, now we've gotten a little bit of, of what the reality is. Both of you are, are leaders and change makers working in the Negev, working very hard as I know from the last six weeks. I'm curious if you could talk more about the initiatives that you're involved with um, and what challenges and opportunities you're seeing through your work. Um, Hanan, if you wanna start and specifically, we'd love to learn more about the emergency room you're involved with. I know you were starting to mention groups of, of Jewish and Arab volunteers working together um, to support the needs in the Negev. Can you tell us a little bit more about that um, and your other work? Yes, sure, thank you. Um, actually, since the October 9, three days after Hamas attack, I was a partner in establishing two large ventures. The first, the first ventures I founded together with my friend Shir Nosatsky, director of Have You Seen the Horizon Lately? Uh, in this uh, venture, this venture called the Joint Jewish Arab Emergency Relief Center in the Bedouin city of Rahat. We run it in cooperation with uh, our partners, the Community Center of Rahat, uh, Desert Stars uh, Movement, and in Nashmiyat. It's a Bedouin woman movement uh, in the unrecognized villages. And the second venture I founded with my colleagues in Itah Ma'ati. Shirin, Nisreen, Ela, Shira, Birla, Muran, and Tagrid, together with the, the volunteers from the unrecognized villages, Fatme, Layla, and Amira. Together, we established 16 emergency centers in, un, in 16 unrecognized villages for only for the single parents' family and the working women, those without, and also for those without citizenship. Through this project, we are giving service around 1,400 family in from in the unrecognized places. And uh, if I want to tell you the story of the joint uh, Jewish Arab emergency venture that we founded, it's like it's come very uh, spontaneously. Yeah, something come from the citizens, the civilians, people, families from the center, from Tel Aviv and. Uh, Kfar Qasim and Jerusalem, they wanted to help after they heard about uh, the Hamas attack on the unrecognized villages and uh, the six uh, killed killed um, victims from the unrecognized villages and the situation, they feel that they want to do something. And uh, after they heard the story also 
about uh, the Bedouin, how they support and they save lives here of the uh, families uh, from uh, Kisufim and Berry, they feel that they want to do something also uh, and support the Bedouin community. Uh, they started to, in, in very small project, families who want to arrive to the unrecognized villages and provide the food, okay? And uh, suddenly we found out that we are get, take, getting a food, not only for the Bedouin who are in unrecognized villages, also for the Jewish uh, families from Nitivot, Ufakim, Shdarot. And uh, one day she called me and said to me, uh, Hanan, why we don't show all the public, all the um, people around us, what we are doing here, because I, suddenly, finally, we, we saw this uh, point of light in this uh, huge darkness. I said, okay, let's do it. And uh, we found in uh, this emergency Arab Jewish uh, uh, emergency, and the emergency in Rahat. And uh, through this uh, project, we supplied food for 2,040 Arab and Jewish families. All of this is organized weekly in every week, Wednesday, in one place. Arab and Jewish volunteers work together, prepare uh, the packet and the food for the families in the unrecognized villages and also from Nitivot uh, uh, and Shudarot. This project, I believe that uh, it make us more strong and feel that we have uh, all, uh, I, another opportunity to create a hope for everybody here. On the, the, um, the picture uh, that we all together, in uh, especially in this sensitive period, war, Arab and Jews, and uh, we have a war and uh, hostages and victims, and still work together and feel that there is a, a opportunity to, to, to over this, this period together. And the second venture provides, uh, as I told you, food and emotional care for children and women. Uh, we, the care, the emotional care, uh, we give it not by Zoom because there is no access to internet, in the unrecognized villages. We provide it by experts in the field, in the unrecognized villages. Also, we are giving them advice and uh, uh, illegal, illegal, illegal advice and support the women who, uh, the women, uh, who sent the uh, Avtala? Uh, unemployment. Unemployment unemployment and also uh, at the same time we are working to make the voices of the women heard in the media and by the decisions makers and this is the reason that we see uh, we see we saw in the um, we see in the itah maaki that this organizing organizing of women from the unrecognized villages who, who say that we want to be part of the solution and we want to help and be active, and we want to bring uh, the needs and uh, solve the problems for the, uh, that the women deal every day in this period. We support this uh, group, the volunteers in Nashmiya, uh, and we want to make sure that uh, they become more involved with the local committee in their, in their village, uh, and they uh, provide the service for the families, uh, for the single parents. And uh, this is the two projects, and thank you for listening. Thank you so much for sharing, Hanan. I'm gonna, we're gonna put in the chat, um, you mentioned that, that there's been some effort on the part of the, the group of NGOs you've been working with to sort of share and promote some of these stories and work, including a video about the emergency center. And so we're gonna put those in the chat if people wanna um, check out those videos later. Um, and I want to turn it over to Shira. We've heard of it from Hanan about specifically the challenges in unrecognized villages. 
um, and sort of the, the joint Jewish Arab humanitarian response and emergency initiatives that emerged from a volunteer civil society place. I'm curious to hear what it's been like for you working in a local government in a city that, as you described, has really been impacted by recent events. Um, what's your work been like? What have you been seeing and experiencing? Okay. So after the after that day, the, the October 7th, Hura was um, at a total standstill. Uh, there was no education, no trade, no welfare. There were nothing. Uh, so we have to we had to restart everything and in the first two weeks we worked around the clock to address the five most sensitive points these days first the physical security and shielding in two weeks after the october 7th in Hura, we man managed to stabilize uh, the resident security to optimum possible during this period uh, we mapped on a geographic system all the family homes without shielding. There is 2,400 residents who lived in uh, a new um, neighborhood that there is no um, no shield at all. And this so day, by shield you mean like rocket shelters, right? Yes, 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 shelters. Yeah. And this day we are uh, purchasing uh, shielding for the most sensitive areas in the settlement. So this is the first uh, point. The second is education. We were the first among the Jewish and the Arab settlement in the Negev to ask for ex uh, ex exception to have physical activity and return the education system to face-to-face -face learning. This was critical because when schools are closed, uh, the children are on the streets and the street is much less protected than school. We also expanded uh, the activities of informal education since we found that children sp spend their free time in social network, which create unbearable dissonance for them. The, the third is community. Uh, the day after that terrible, th that terrible day, we made contact with each uh, and everyone from Hura sensitive population to check their situation and needs. We had some experience from uh, the COVID days in taking care of the weaker population in the community. Still, it was clear to us uh, back then that we respond only to what we see. And it is just the tip of the iceberg of the challenges that our community is facing. At that time, uh, we realized also that, thing that, that things are happening in the lives of residents now that we no longer know how to define or give answers. So therefore, we created dozens of meetings with the residents' groups uh, to learn about their, need, their needs and give answers together with partners in uh, civil society and the government. In each neighborhood, we establish an emergency leadership team that identify needs, receives training, budget, and supports to hold community events and door-to-door -door aid uh, in neighborhoods. We also created a women team to do the same for women in Hoa. For employment, we found that uh, a lot of young people stopped working uh, because their workplace work less or because they were fired. We know that young people are among the biggest victims of such times, those who have not yet recovered from the occupational damage of COVID. We understand that those who want to be returning soon to the work circle can remain outside of it for many months. We know this affects their physical security and also their attitude toward Israeli state and society. So to support this group, we held a webinar in cooperation with the Employment Service in Israel, in which we represent inf information uh, regarding their rights. We established a right ex extraction center with volunteers to help those, yo those young people submit forms to extract the grants uh, they deserve from government. We also establish a system that locates jobs and opportunities for employment and professional training and connected them to our to our young men and women. 
More than that, we also handle to ch the challenge uh, of local small businesses that having hard times and establish a support system for them also. Fifth and last, uh, connection to society in the Negev. Bedouin society in the Negev, as Hanan said better than me, lives between two trusts. These two loyalties are currently at conflict which it, with each other. On one hand, they are a part of the Israeli society that was affected by Hamas brutal attack and they paid a terrible personal price during it. On the other hand, they are part of the Arab people. A good number of Bedouin residents in the Negev have families in Gaza, even Laila that were here with us, and the mayor of Khura who has a first class family in Gaza. The emotional um, challenge is not only internal struggle between the two identities or their two loyalties, but it is also an external, external struggle with the Israeli society that ask them again and again to prove loyalty, but make them more than once to feel rejection and a lot of suspicious. In the first weeks, uh, Bedouin were not allowed to enter Jewish settlements. Hundreds were fired from their job and many of them were and still are prevented from a uh, living settlement to nearby cities even for medical services. If before the war, every community tended to close in on itself, we see how the walls are getting higher and that what we have achieved and that what we have achieved until now, especially since May 21 is in danger. The deeper, the deeper we look, the better we understand the magnitude of the challenge and the historical opportunity to build a more common story between the communities in the Negev. The lives of Bedouin and the Jews in the Negev are complete, completely interwined in employment, academy, um, commerce, medicine, and more. And that's good. It's part of the Negev spatial DNA. This understanding encourage us to keep on finding new partners and try new things. It will give, I will give uh, some examples of things that the Hua local council is promoting these days. First, a local campaign in the multitude of voices that are circulating now, the voice that reminds the reality that we are all here to stay is a non-negotiable uh, fact should stand out. This is how it was before the war. This is how the war reminds us it will be the day after uh, as well. To overcome voices that uh, identify the Bedouin residents as the enemy, since they are part of the entire Arab community, we must highlight cases of heroism of Bedouin society in the line of fire, but we must also talk about the day-to-day -day partnership, partnership that oblige, the oblige us uh, to have responsibility in order to continue living here together the day after. We want to continue to receive medical treatment from uh, the, the Bedouin doctor in Soorka and to continue study together in the campuses. We are promoting a, a campaign that will promote these messages. In employment, the employment market is changing. There are new needs in the market that create new jobs and there are existing jobs that suffer from lack of workers who are in the reserves. We understand that we must invest in the system of locating opportunities, connecting them to the, the opportunities to the benefits uh, that exist in employment of young Bedouins while, while, while accompanying, accompanying our young people in adapting to the, their new workplace in order it to be a success. We are working to today to build such, such a system and we are looking for partners to join us. Education. We would like to have more and more meeting between children and youth uh, from Hura and the neighboring settlement. For example, 
a shared learning project in the agricultural uh, school Wadi Atir in Khura for children for elementary school in Khura and surrounding settlements that includes planting, milking, preparing honey and more. The studies are in mixed group and, it, and in both languages. What enables to the, the children to get closer and, de and develop more positive attitude in, the, in themselves and in their environment toward uh, other communities. Our vision in Hura municipality is to, de de to develop Hura by integrating with the environment, co comprehensive economic development, higher education, quality employment, and shared community life. World War II built London. Bad things will remain with us after the war. And question and the question is, will we succeed to create important things as well in the context of partnership between the communities? Honestly, Hua is a weak community. The Bedouins are a weakened community, and usually weakened communities pay the highest prices in time like this especially if they are in the line of fire. We as a, cons uh, us, as a local author authority will be happy for any partnership uh, that will be formed from this meeting. Um, and I want to thank you again uh, for inviting us and let us tell the story of the Bedouins in Hoa. Thank you both so much for being with us. Um, I'm starting to take some questions from the Q&A and the chat. And I noticed we, we've already discussed two of them focusing on women's leadership, which we've heard so inspiringly through your own work and your work with the women and, and unrecognized villages and also questions about employment and men working. Um, a question that I also wanted to ask, you started bringing up that Jewish Arab relations are feeling have felt challenging because of the complex identity that Bedouin citizens hold, because sort of walls go up when people are feeling afraid and when a trauma has happened. I'm wondering, this is a question for, for both of you, as you look forward, now that we're you know a month and a half out looking forward, what are your biggest concerns ongoing about Bedouin Jewish relations in the Negev? And what do you think are the most important tools that exist to address some of those concerns as the war continues to go on. Um, I know you sort of touched on this a little bit already, Shira. So Hanan, do you have any thoughts on the challenges of Bedouin Jewish relations in the Negev and, and what should be done about it? Uh, actually, uh, there is something uh, I've been changed lately after the war, Yani. The, the relationship between the Arab and Jewish after the campaign, the NGOs did and show and told all the stories about what, how the Bedouin and the Arab work together, to save lives, uh, and they try to locating a uh, missing uh, people. Uh, you, you, we feel that there is more trust and they want to be together, but still there is another group that feel that we should they should not trust the Bedouin community. Uh, to be honest, I, I'm I'm really worried about uh, after the war what will be happened. That uh, all of us we will forget what happened, and uh, who pay the high price here in the Negev. It's true that there is a lot of families uh, are victims, but still there is an one population that they are uh, exposed all the time, everywhere um, to Hamas rocket and feel that they are on security because there is no shelters and they are unrecognized, even they are their citizen of, the, uh, of Israel. Um, for now, I hear that uh, a lot of people here from the Jewish community, they want, they want to raise the voice of the Bedouin community, especially in the unrecognized villages, and they want to take a part in their struggle. Uh, in the second hand, um, uh, all the gov 
during in the during the war, the government promised that they will find solutions for the people in the unrecognized villages, and they say that they will have a plan. I I just for a I just אני חוששת שזה יהיה רק על נייר. It will be only on paper and, uh, and after the war they will forget. So we need somebody. It's not if the, if the NGOs, if the government will not do their role, the NGOs must to be prepared to continue to replace the government in the unrecognized villages until the justice will be right for them. I see um, we're going to take one other content question. And then there's also been a lot of questions asking about resources, how to learn more about different initiatives, how to follow up on this call. So I'm going to save a minute at the end to share some of that before we close. Someone asked about Ben Gurion University and if they're doing anything to help um, unify communities and navigate the situation. I'm going to expand the question a little bit to ask about the the challenges, some of that's come up with the role of uh, happening at universities, um, and what role you think universities play in Jewish Arab relations at this moment. Um, Shira, do you want to try to take that or Hanan? Um. I really don't know what the universities are doing right now, but I do know that uh, one of the biggest concern that we have, uh, I think that it uh, represents the whole uh, Bedouin community is the, um, the day after in the campuses, because we know that the campuses in, in I think in America you 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 experience it in it right now is a place that um, the students feels they have to raise their their voice and a lot of a lot of times the the conflicts the conflict uh, is being very louded in in this um, uh, in these places so. Uh, we are afraid that the uh, Bedouin students will not feel safe to um, to go to campuses and they will um, not go uh, and, and learn in the Israeli academy or at any academy at all. So I don't know what they are doing right now. There is no academy right now like they, so I think that they, going to open like a month um, from now, um, but I don't know what they are doing. Hanan, if you know something else. It's, so. it's, it's not that they are not going to the academy, but it's still the, the academy and um, uh, they are following about their students and uh, the situation that they are prevent from the students to express their opinion. Uh, it's something. It's um, it's not good in my opinion because uh, the student uh, what they are coming to the university to the academics to be improved uh, uh, and uh, to learn how uh, about to express themselves and their opinion and uh, uh, to be a part of. Uh, to empower and develop uh, the community and the society here and the, the state. But uh, with this uh, um, method, uh, method. Attitude. attitude, I'm afraid that the, uh, the academic send a, a very dangerous message for the students, that there is no democracy here and you cannot express yourself and uh, there is a, a and you will be under control all the time and will you will do what uh, you asked to do um, i'll share two things before we close out that um i'm also seeing someone wrote in the q a that they know that ben gurion is starting to take measures um schools returning in theory on the 24th and they're trying to create some of these proactive steps to deal with frictions that might happen on campus and as Hanan was, was saying, we've been hearing a lot about in our work, not just at Ben Gurion University, but the challenge of navigating social media, 
students speaking their mind, censorship, what can you can't can or can't you say? Will you get expelled? Will you get suspended? In some ways, com- she's mirroring what we're seeing in the Jewish community and um, navigating things on U.S. college campuses. Um, but also in other ways, it's very different. Um, I'll just plug, we don't have anything on the calendar yet, but these sort of bigger questions about speech, what are things like on college campuses and in office places and shared spaces where Jewish and Arab citizens are meeting in this really difficult time extends far beyond the Negev to the rest of the country. And there's also pretty amazing initiatives happening in mixed cities. And um, we're gonna be arranging a few more calls like this one where we're gonna explore some of those issues in sort of a broader context of what's happening in Israel um, at a later date. So please stay tuned and follow on our listserv um, to find out when those next calls are happening. We also have a question in the chat about how you could donate, how can you support the type of initiatives like we were hearing. Um, We shared in the chat as well, a link to a document about some of the major coordinating efforts happening. Um, and some some of the reports that we've been writing on what initiatives are out there, or how to connect. Also, please feel free in touch with us in the chat. You'll see our emails, both for sort of questions about engaging and learning more about some of those resources, about finding out what needs are and how to get involved. Or if you'd like to do programs like this and bring educational content um, to your own communities um, and to your own learners. We'll share two more resources just here. Uh, One is an educational resource we created that highlights some of these stories of heroism, of lives lost and challenges of joint Jewish Arab work and the things people are experiencing, like a curated list of resources you can use in your educational work. Um, And we'll keep you up to date as we do more programs to try to bring these really important issues out there. Thank you again to Shira and Hanan for being with us. Um, we just heard everything you're doing, how how busy and overwhelmed you are. So really, we're very grateful you're here. And Shira, again, pass on our gratitude and our thoughts and prayers to Layla. And we'll certainly be following as we are with all the hostages to see what happens with, with Samir and are praying for his well-being. Um, stay in touch and thank you all for joining.